welcome back to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today via Zoom, taped at the Folio in downtown Seattle, is first novelist Natalie Zena Walshutz talking about her book, wildly entertaining novel, Hench. Natalie, thank you for joining me and um, the audience. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this is a pleasure. Well, I, I found your novel, Hench, to be one of the best things about the pandemic. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's intensely flattering. <laughs> yes, right. It took me away um, and, and gave me this whole other world to be in. Um, so could you give, like, whatever elevator pitch you do for Hench? How would you? I mean, I know how I describe it, but I'm interested in how you describe it. Well, certainly. Um, so Hench is a novel about uh, a young Hench person um, who sort of is uh, is rising in notoriety via data science more than violence, um, a, a more typical henching path. Um, she is, like many of us, working a series of terrible jobs for uh, equally terrible people, but paying rent and buying food is important. Um, however, after a run-in with a superhero that leaves her gravely injured, um, she ends up uh, digging more deeply into the cost that superheroes have on the communities that they're ostensibly there to protect. Um, and what she uh, discovers um, sort of spurs on the the next stage of her career so I think I think that that's how I would describe it there's a there's a surprising number of spreadsheets um, and a lot of body horror and I also promise it is kind of funny at least so uh, oh I, I thought it was very funny I, I thought it was just a delight and the way I talk about it is that um, that superheroes have sidekicks like Batman and Robin but bad guys have hench people and that Anna is a hench, a hench person, and that her great talent is not with a gun or a knife or any of the things that you would expect hench, henchmen or hench people to be talented at, that her great talent is um, big data and spreadsheets. And, and, you know, just saying big data always appeals to librarians because that's so much <laughs> of, of what, what, what we're working with. Where did the idea for this book come from? Where did this? So, I mean, I've been fascinated by hench people for a very long time. I find the idea of the role is so utterly necessary um, for kind of any superhero universe to work. Um, and we sort of think of hench people as, you know, a, a, exactly the sort of like like uh like bodyguards plus <laughs> right like they're there for combat they're there to kind of protect the supervillain they're there to kind of be the cannon fodder that's that's thrown at heroes and sort of the early stages of a fight that sort of thing um but somebody has to answer the phone right and somebody has to you know deliver the mail and somebody has to make coffee for all those really villainous meetings. Um, and when you, when you sort of start thinking about, you know, who's, uh, you know, who's sweeping the floors on the death star, right? Like who's, who's keeping the lights on and cleaning the toilets. Uh, it gets very funny, very quickly, and also very real, very quickly. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the idea of the plight of the hench person is uh, kind of connected to a kind of super heroic realism that we don't see very often. You know, we, the, the camera is most often on people who are very busy trying to save the world or the universe. Or um, destroy it. Yeah, exactly. Or or the but whereas the people who are just trying to save their rent, uh, we don't see them very often. And I, I thought turning the camera in that direction would be would be pretty interesting. Was it fun to write? It was a blast. Yeah, absolutely. It was. Uh, I mean, writing is labor like anything else. And there are for sure moments when it was like I feel like I should have just been a plumber and my life would be much simpler and more straightforward. And you kind of want to, uh, you know, rethink all of your choices that led you to this moment. It's usually about midway through the second draft, I think. Um, but it's, it was super fun. I, uh, one of the best pieces of writing advice I've ever received 
um, is write the things you enjoy and don't write the things you don't enjoy or, you know, write, write the things that you love it when it happens in a book and do not write the things that you do not enjoy when it happens in the book. Um, and just having the freedom to like the own, the internal freedom to just only write the kinds of things I wanted to and that I loved doing was wonderful. So I got to, I got to make a whole book out of stuff I like, um, it turns out you can just do that and no one will stop you. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I've, the, the advice that I've always heard similar to that is um, write a book that you would want to read. Yeah, and this is a book that I, I fervently wanted to find in the universe, right? Like I, I wanted this story very badly and I was waiting for it for a long time. Like, when do I get to read a story about a hench person? Uh, and I, I slowly came to the terrible realization that it, it was indeed I who was going to have to put it in there if I wanted to see it. And are you a big spreadsheet person? I'm a very, I like receipts. So I, I like proof. <laughs> I'm much more of a proof person. Like I, I want to know what the facts are. Uh, I, I, I also very much like tracking things or keeping, keeping track of things. Um, a thing that that got me through the rougher parts of the writing process was tracking my word count and just like watching the number slowly go up is very gratifying. Um, so yeah, I've, I'm certainly somebody who's fascinated by big data and fascinated by data science and 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 you know interested in those kinds of things. But the thing that really gives me joy is being able to produce like here is a hard number. Uh, or here is a like here's a legitimate document. This is not just you know I'm I'm not just making this up. I can prove it. Feels really good to me. So there's a lot of you and Anna, the main character. I think I think that's fair. I've kind of uh, only medium joked that uh, Hinch is an autobiography or a thinly veiled autobiography. Um, there are there are certainly some key differences, but when I was, uh, it's you know it it's a it's an easy thing to imagine myself into the world that she inhabits and the, and the kind of situations that she finds herself in as somebody who has, you know, been really scared about how I was going to, you know, stay in my apartment and, you know, also pay all my bills and, and eat something at some point in the net, you know, until I got paid again. Um, and who had, uh, you know, who, who's, it wasn't just me, but, you know, sort of all of these hilarious geniuses, all of my friends and colleagues um, tended to be people who were utterly brilliant and wildly overqualified and unable to find the place where they fit or who had been trained for a very specific place in the world that suddenly was not there or was not there in the way that they had promised. A lot of this was... Um, had to do with academia. You know, I, I, as a, as a much younger person, I thought I was going to sort of do the direct kind of master's to PhD to teaching in a, in a university, um, you know, the, the ivory tower pipeline and just like never have to emerge again and just like apprentice myself to a wizard and everything would be fine. Uh, and I, like a lot of people around my age, uh, was confronted by the fact that those jobs we were told would be there were not, uh, just like simply did not exist. And so uh, that was a really rough time. And, and I, I feel uh, I was kind of a, very easily able to dream myself into some of the, you know, it's, at least early on in the book, some of the very difficult situations that Anna finds herself in. Was, was the position in that um, ivory tower uh, in, in um, literature? I know you're, you're a poet too. Yes, unfortunately, uh, I am. Uh, <laughs> I have, uh, I did a, a, both an undergraduate and a master's in uh, contemporary Canadian poetry and creative writing. So I did creative manuscripts um, for them as well as a thesis. Would you like to do two theses? Turns out you can and ruin your entire life. I definitely got pneumonia doing them my master's degree. So it was a time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have was fascinated by contemporary poetry there's also another universe in which i'm a i'm a shakespearean scholar uh a, a slightly different different path opened up over there but yeah my my background is in literature and uh the, my sort of first creative love was poetry certainly um you know that's that's what my first two books are um 
but uh, yeah, it's been it's been a long and weird journey since then, which doesn't mean that any of that love has gone anywhere. Um, certainly not. But uh, just where I am located in that constellation is certainly different. Well, I know that you're a big um, games player, computer games player and Dungeons and Dragons. So how did that all fit in with um, your love of reading and I mean, what, what was your life like as a kid? <laughs> what was my life like as a kid? A oh, teenager. man, very strange. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've i always been a huge fan of escapist media. So, you know, when I was, when I was a little kid, I read a ton of fantasy uh, and science fiction and horror. You know, they're all, they're all sort of dreaming yourself into another place and, and often being very viscerally connected to what's, you know, happening in a, in an, an alternate universe in some way um, that has always defined the media that I'm most interested in is can this transport me somewhere else um, when I and then as a as a young teenager I think I was about 13 when I started um, playing tabletop role playing games really actively uh, which also sort of, um, led me down the dark path into live action role play or LARP uh, as a like every nerdy teenager of a of a certain varietal i i played a lot of vampire the masquerade in sort of my early and mid-teens uh that left a, a a deep mark on me um which are which are all again sort of dreaming yourself into being another person and and being in another place and uh taking on another identity which was both very freeing and very cathartic um for me uh which is also i think present in video games you're taking on a different avatar you are making choices for a character whether that's a character who sort of is like crafted to look a particular way whether that looks like you or whether you're taking on the mantle of a completely different identity and, and kind of placing yourself in their position um it's all about leaving where you are and i think that has always defined uh the things that i'm most interested in and that that capture me most completely how does poetry fit into that? Poetry is kind of the opposite of that. It's about being uh, anchored and present and uh, having deeply present flashes of, uh, I don't want to say inspiration, but um, awareness or connectedness, I think, is, is probably better. Um, I'm very interested in constraint-based poetry, um, so like Ulipo and, uh, you know, any of the sort of like very mannerist or very structural um, structural poetry is, uh, is what I enjoy writing the most and what I'm kind of uh, driven to make the most. Um, I'm very interested in how many constraints or how many rules you can place uh, on a potential piece and still have something that works, you know, like what, what kind of like, uh, what kind of structure emerges from that very high pressure environment, something I'm very, very interested in. Um, but it's all about immediacy and and presence and precision. Um, so it's kind of the opposite side of that creative coin in a lot of ways. You know, Robert Frost once famously said that poetry that didn't rhyme, it was like playing tennis without a net. So he had, <laughs> some, you know, he had some of that um, that same interest in, in, in at least the constraint of rhyme. Absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, rhyme is a very interesting one uh, in that it's, I think it's the most common and yet most poorly understood in terms of constraints. Like it's the thing that we associate with poetry on the, on the sort of like most basic level, but at the same time, uh, rhyme, rhyme and meter are in intensely weird. And I don't need to tell you this, of course, but like they're intensely weird and complicated things. Um, so as, as much as they are, they are cliche for a reason, like all cliches, they are there for a reason. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of on Frost's side with this one, even though most of my poetry doesn't rhyme, but it does have rules um, it does, and, and often very intense and complicated rules. And I think that, uh, I think that that's where, for me anyway, that's where the beauty emerges. It's not like, let's have a wide field to wander in. It's like, what can we grow in this tiny space? Like what will still bloom here, I think is, is, 
it was really interesting um which isn't to say the other one is wrong it's just what i like are there other contemporary poets your age or people who are um writing with that constraint poetry absolutely um a little bit, like so, sort of just slightly before me, um, Karen Soley's work had a, a really big impact on me. Um, Jordan Scott uh, is a is a contemporary of mine whose work I, I love a lot. Um, Sarah Pinkster's work is really amazing. Um, the person I probably owe the most to is Christian Book, who I, I worked with uh, as a graduate student and who, you know, did a lot for me and whose creative guidance was incredibly important to me. So certainly his work as uh, I both love and also had like a real impact on me as a, as a human person. Um, I'm definitely leaving like literally thousands of people out right now. This is one of those questions that like terrifies me. It's like, how can I list everybody whom I like right. <laughs> in this one moment? Um, so I, I beg forgiveness of the, you know, 1200 poets that I owe a huge debt to. Um, but there are, there, there are many and they are wonderful. Uh, and in Canada in particular, we have such a vibrant and strange experimental poetry community up here. Um, and uh, I highly recommend kind of, looking north of the border for some of the some of the weirder work is some of the stuff coming out of out of uh alberta in particular um is really incredible wow um i guess my major i guess one of my when i as soon as i finished the book my first question was i wonder if she's gonna write a sequel because i i couldn't wait for a sequel i also wonder this yes right <laughs> what do you uh, what's what what are you thinking right now about a sequel i would love to honestly i i would it was very important that hench be a complete arc um uh, yeah. because who knows what Right. any future holds right and I, I certainly didn't want to put um too many narrative eggs in a future basket right i wanted i wanted this to be a complete thing uh at the same time i wanted to leave some doors open um i love this universe i think there is a lot more to explore with these characters i'd love to spend more time with them um I think that there, there's there's a lot of very rich and fertile ground here that i'd i I think deserves time and energy. Um, there's also characters like I think Quantum Entanglement most uh, most urgently. I would like to spend more time with. So much happens for her off screen. This is just not. That's just not right. where she is present. Uh, is this story? And I really want to give her more, you know, screen time. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be that would be really lovely. So um, I'm I'm certainly moving toward it whether it will exist on the earth is very up in the air but it's something that i'm actively thinking about and working on and and uh trying to make happen my husband listened to the book uh, listened to the oh. audio book and really really enjoyed that did you have a say um or did you have you listened to the audio book I have I had a lot of say actually. I um my my experience uh honestly with uh with William Moore was extraordinary. Like they were so good to work with. Um David is uh, a human angel and the the whole team was just really incredible. Um so I got to hear a bunch of samples and I got to uh a, and the narrator Alex McKenna was by far and away my first choice she was extraordinary um she, i i knew her work previously as well she's the voice of sadie in red dead redemption 2 uh so i knew her video game voice work um so i thought you know there's there's definitely something there there's a fit there but she's so funny uh and her her kind of like deadpan humor is like she really, really nailed it. Uh, so I'm very pleased to say I got I got a lot of say and uh, and that I was agreed with enthusiastically. And, you know, she was my first choice. And yeah, and the well, audio because as it is. Well, then he, uh, he Joe, my husband, Joe, would give you, you know, a, a, an upvote um, for your, for <laughs> Moro's you. choices and your choice um, for that narrator. And I'm looking forward to listening um, listening to it. Too. I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm super yeah. pleased with how it turned out. Um, do you see this 
I mean, I could see the kind of cinematic qualities of this, you know. Was that in your head? I mean, was were like um, role playing games in in your in your mind while you were working on this? It's like a role player's. Um, I was going to say fantasy, but yes, that's true. true. It is. I mean, yeah. <laughs> literally, as, it as is. are all. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, right. Like, I do like that phrase, though. Um, it wasn't. I think it, it's more like all of that, just pervasively like by osmosis got in there um so the uh a question i've got is like did i did i write this imagining like a movie version um no i wrote it imagining the book version um there's none of that was sort of actively in my head while i was making the thing i just wanted to make the thing um and novels are great because you don't have to worry about like oh will the artist be able to like draw this in the way that i want or will the rendering engine capture this the way that i want it to or you're not limited by technology in any way you can just make stuff up and write it write it down and it happens it's fantastic um so I was writing for that. I was writing kind of without the concerns of like, what can this game engine do? Or what can, you know, what are what are sort of the like limits of the, the other forms of art I'm intersecting with? Um, that said, I think that uh, it's impossible to write about superheroes without it being very visual and very cinematic. Like that's, that's just an innate part of the genre um, or it certainly is an innate part of the genre as I have absorbed it um, and, and, uh, and now I guess turn it out. Um, that's, that's just kind of in there. Uh, but it, it wasn't something that I was using as a conscious guide or trying to do. Um, but I think it's fair to say that that uh, is always present and just kind of defines the way that I work now. Um, because I've, I've spent so much time there and spent so much time writing in those modes. It's, it seems to me that fantasy has always been um, a kind of haven, if you will, for um, different ways of thinking about gender and sexuality. I think I think that's absolutely fair, which is which is sort of funny because there are like all the kind of nerd spaces, right? Whether that's role playing or, you know, fantasy and sci-fi or video games have such extraordinarily diverse communities and attract so many wonderful weirdos um, and are can be such like safe havens for people. Um, at the same time, the uh, the kind of like, hateful aspects of those communities can be super virulent and there can be um uh, i'm i'm often very surprised by I, I suppose i shouldn't be at this point but surprised by the intensity of of the kind of pushback against those safe spaces or those safe havens or you know the sort of idea that like oh these are these are these are not spaces for queer folks or these are not spaces for people of color these aren't spaces for women that they're like for straight white men and always have been it's like mm, no actually we're weird and we've been here all the time i certainly have been here the whole time so i don't know what you're talking about um so i think i think there's a very there's a tension there between like yes there are these incredible like safe spaces and havens and and fantasy and and speculative fiction in general and role playing and and games in general offer the possibility for these extraordinary spaces um at the same time that they often get an intense pushback for that's having those spaces um so it's it's a uh, so yes, and, you know, yes, and there's also this, this other aspect to it that is consistently both troubling and surprising. If, if someone loved Hench, as I did, um, what would you suggest that I read next? That is a great question. Um, I think... Uh, Vicious by V.E. Schwab is is often, is, it has been compared to, and I think that that's an excellent comparison. Um, I was pretty deeply uh, impacted by Soon I Will Be Invincible when that book came out. Um, it was one of the, one of the first, like, from the villain's perspective reads, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm really 
loving um, Gideon the Ninth and Harrow the Ninth. They are so funny. I don't if if you have not read them, uh, they are hilarious. Um, I also am in love with uh, with Becky Chambers' work in general. Um, the way that she like her work is so intensely readable. It's just a it's a joy. Like the stories are so good, and the text is so easy and pleasurable to engage with in the way that she sort of incorporates like news stories and emails and just like other, the intertextuality of it the effortless intertextuality of it i think is is really really wonderful so kind of anything she's touched i would i definitely would recommend um so i think i think the again i'm i'm for sure leaving a approximately 8,000 things that i love out that i will think of immediately after this call ends be like ah um but those definitely are what leap to mind. When you were a kid, what were what did you read? Were you big into fantasy and science oh, yeah. fiction then? Do you, do you, were there uh, particular writers that you? Oh man, um, I mean, you know, it's it's a pretty standard answer, but like Lord of the Rings is incredibly important and was incredibly important to me as a as a baby nerd for sure. Um, I read a lot of Stephen King, especially a lot of Stephen King short stories um, that had you know like a, a pretty significant impact on me um i read basically anything that looked like it might have a dragon or a wizard on the cover and uh and which includes like the sort of shannara series and like the belgariad and the malorian and the every dragon lance book in the entire world so there was uh if there was someone like holding an orb <laughs> <laughs> on the cover or some or some sort of like scaly creature in the background wings maybe definitely purchased by me <laughs> right so. I, I i can't remember who who defined the difference between science fiction and fantasy was that if there's if there's green on the cover it's fantasy and if there's a rivet it's science fiction that's very good <laughs> so that's, i thought that I, was just really on the cover that's yeah, that's I, spectacular I, I, he, this and person for, probably said it better accurate the uh much like books about magic, the like more ridiculous the cover, the better the book is. It's like, ah, yes, this one, this one will be, there's me, there are many sta staves and I think that looks like a griffin. I shall purchase this one is, is definitely something that influenced my taste a lot when I was like 11 to 14. My guest today at Folio on Book Lust is Natalie Zena Walshots, whose first novel, Hench, was just published by William Morrow. Natalie, thank you so much. This was as much fun as I hoped it would be, and I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoyed it too. This was an absolute delight. Thank you so much for having me. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.